Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to this third of the Monday Night Lecture Q&As of this term. Uh, I'm really delighted this evening to be joined by Professor David Simon, who uh, who is here with me, speaking to me <laughs> live. And, uh, and David, yeah, thank you so much for joining us and for, for lending, lending your time. Um, David, as many of you will know at home, gave a brilliant lecture last week on, uh, on sustainable cities and, and three really important agenda points that, uh, that he highlighted for us. And I'm sure he's going to draw that out a little bit more. Um, just to say that this is, being, this is being shared, this is for you to use in your classrooms, uh, if you're teachers, if you're students, this should hopefully be really helpful for or for your studies, if you're if you're doing either GCSE uh, or, or A level, uh, David has produced a really helpful uh, kind of educational support pack that goes alongside this lecture. So download that from the the Royal Holloway Geography Teacher Hub, and and you can use this material uh, to to help in your classroom or in your revision. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that towards the end of the lecture and give you all of the links and everything that you need uh, for that. So, so David, thanks again for, for joining us. Uh, I, I've taken the opportunity to watch your lecture this, this past week and I, I personally have learned a lot and I've got lots of questions. I would also say to anybody at home, if you've got questions, <clears throat> do ask them, if you're watching on YouTube, ask them in YouTube comments. If you're, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, you can ask there. Uh, I'll also be monitoring the Twitter feed. So if you want to subtweet us, then you can, you can ask a question that way. <clears throat> But as I always do with all of the Monday night lecture speakers, I always just ask them a little summary of the lecture from the week before. Um, so, David, I'm going to pass over to you. Could you just maybe just remind the, the viewers and remind me of some of the key highlight topics that you were trying to address last week? Sure. Thanks, Al. And it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I think I'd summarize it in terms of um, the three broad components, if you like, into which I divided the lecture. The first one was talking a little bit about uh, sustainability to unpack the concept and explain how it has um, arisen and been applied in different ways at different points in time and different disciplines and so on, and then bringing that round to the way in which the current global sustainable development agenda, if you like, um, that was agreed by all the member states of the UN in 2015 and 2016 sort of came about and now occupies the, the central ground of international collaborations, um, symbolizing the fact that all member states, rich, poor, and everything in between, um, at least have signed up to the idea that sustainable development is everybody's business, not just poor people, rich people, fat people, or thin people. And crucially, that sustainability has to be worked for right now and not in the context of climate change or broader environmental changes left for our children and grandchildren. The second component of the talk drills down into um, that agenda, and I distinguished the five components uh, in terms of the international agreements and agendas, they have different names, one on disaster risk reduction, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, of which the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals are, uh, to all intents and purposes, a monitoring and evaluation framework. Thirdly, the uh, COP21 Paris Agreement on Climate Change, then the Addis Ababa Agenda on Financing for Development to make sure that there are resources there to facilitate um, adaptation, technological transitions and so on by poor and lower middle income countries. And then finally, uh, the one that focuses entirely on um, urban areas, the new urban agenda, uh, which was the last of the five to be put in place. But that symbolizes, as does having a specific goal, goal 11, to make human settlements uh, safe, inclusive, and sustainable, uh, symbolizes the fact that as a species, Homo sapiens is now predominantly urban. And therefore, to talk about sustainability or to work towards achieving something called sustainability without urban areas being uh, central to that is completely meaningless. Conversely, on the other hand, you cannot have sustainable cities or towns in the absence of sustainability across the wider regional, national or global territories and spaces 
of which cities are fundamental components, because that's the point. It's the relationships, the interactions, the flows um, between areas defined as urban and administered politically uh, by local authorities or other bodies as urban, and those areas and people and interactions beyond the urban area that are fundamentally uh, crucial. And um, the final component of the lecture really looked at different conceptualizations of that complex, particularly at the urban scale, and highlighted these three core characteristics of accessibility, of green and blueness, and of fairness, the latter of which, or the last of which, focuses on the justice equity debates and where some of the most fundamental challenges um, can be found, and perhaps those will be the subject of some of your questions. David, thanks, thanks so much for, for that really helpful summary. We've actually already had some questions in uh, that have come in over the past week, but uh, again, I would just invite anybody watching at home, please do submit your questions uh, for David. I mean, David, it'd be fair to say that you, I can say this, uh, you'd be far too modest, but you, you, David really is a, a world expert and, uh, and has been involved in some of the, the, the key uh, debates in this area. In fact, David, my, my first question to you was going to be, could you just say a little bit more about how you got into this subject? I, I mean, you, you are, or at least I characterize you in my own mind as a development geographer, but you've, you've then, I think really interestingly, you, you've then gone into the policy world as well, and you've slightly, you've slightly stepped out, I think, of, of straight university life, and you've had this really interesting alternative life. Do you maybe just want to say a little bit more about that? Because I sure. think that policy mm -hmm. is absolutely critical to understanding your lecture this evening. Okay, thanks, Al. Yes, I, I first became interested in and, and actively engaged in work on cities and climate change um, shortly after the turn of the millennium when I became involved in developing a science plan for a 10-year program to look at urbanization and environmental change, which was one of these international flagship programs of an international body working on the human dimensions of uh, environmental change. And I was involved in that on the Scientific Steering Committee and actually doing research throughout its, uh, it became 11 year cycle, and then um, built that into its successor initiative uh, in about 2015, 16. Wrote a lot of papers, collaborations, co-edited a, a key book on that. And then at the end of 2014, um, I, was seconded for five and a quarter years as director of Mr. Urban Futures, which was the leading international research center on urban sustainability uh, based in Sweden. And as part of which I developed a world leading program undertaking comparative research across cities in different parts of the world, North and South, um, where local partnerships between university academics and researchers, local authorities, civil society organizations, some private sector organizations, so on, um, identified interests that could be shared and where they worked together to try to find solutions that were locally appropriate, uh, drawing on sort of good international practice, but ultimately grounded locally, which is really important. Then we looked at what was the distinction between the sort of specific local conditions or circumstances that made something work and how far one could generalize to create guidelines for good practice, which we've disseminated through all sorts of different outputs in different formats for academics, for policymakers, practitioners, and so on, and all the way up to the UN. And that kind of comes full circle because for a number of years, um, I've been acting as a periodic advisor consultant to the UN, particularly the Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat, um, in various ways helped uh, launch their Citizen Climate Change Initiative. And most recently, literally uh, last week, sent in revised drafts of my key concluding chapter on building resilience for sustainable urban futures in their World Cities Report 2022, which will be launched at the World Urban Forum in Katowice in Poland at the end of June this year. David, thanks. Thanks so much for that summary. Uh, I mean, I, I think that those kind of policy connections, I think, will be very interesting to many people, for example, considering a degree in geography, because I think maybe many people imagine Absolutely that the, right. yeah. the only thing that people, you know, the only things that people can do with a geography <clears throat> degree 
become an academic or or a, or a school teacher. The truth is that geographers are are heavily involved now in key policy debates on everything from from climate change to to urban futures, as you say, to geopolitics, which of course is my subject. So I, I just wanted to tease that out a little bit more and to understand sure. where that where that had come from. And it's so, really important to note in that context, Al, that people in the UN in local authorities, and I work quite a lot with UK local authorities these days, as well as those in, in the other cities where we've been engaged for a number of years, and they all regard geographers as eminently suitable employees, precisely because of its breadth, but also the integrative nature, whereas many other disciplines are much more siloed um, and narrow in focus. So having a geography degree, um, and obviously if you do postgrad beyond that, maybe a master's, really makes you employable um, in all sorts of sectors and is a good way of keeping your subsequent sort of career direction options open rather than having to hardwire them uh, at school the way you would if you know that you want to undertake uh, a career, say, in medicine or veterinary science or civil engineering, where there are certain subject choices that are mandatory and you have very little flexibility. I think a lot of people will find that very reassuring, not not these, <laughs> not these uh, frankly. Um, so, so, David, you know, when I think about uh, the teaching that I received as an undergraduate about development studies, you know, there was the famous kind of Rosto modernization model. There were neoliberal approaches to development, all very top down, very macroeconomic. Right. What, when did the city emerge as a key unit that people started to think about development happening within and through? Well, um, I'm not sure that there's one sort of obvious correct answer. I think there are several strands to it. And the one probably through which I came, I would say, is, is almost the longest standing. And that is, uh, as, as you said earlier, you think of me as de development geography, which is where I spent most of the, the early and mid parts of my career uh, working in the global south mm -hmm. and where many of the issues, challenges and problems that we now focus on globally in the sort of post development context or post Cold War um, context where we sort of think of one world rather than two or three or four worlds. Uh, in, in terms of the contemporary terminologies that, that were in use at different points, um, many of those issues actually emerged and were the subject of research and policy far sooner, far earlier in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, South and Southeast Asia, for example, and even China, than in Europe, North America, and Japan, precisely because of the sharp contrast between wealth and poverty, divergences in terms of um, life expectancy, quality of life, access to education, and therefore the pathways open, which in turn reflected colonial and imperial policy legacies in, in many cases. Uh, and then it's only, as it were, more recently, particularly since um, the end of, of empire, uh, European empires, that is, uh, in post-war, uh, World War II era, you know, ending in the late 60s, mid 70s, and then the increasing numbers of migrants from former colonial um, territories coming to live and work in Western Europe, North America, that many of the multicultural issues and challenges and the other things that I've alluded to came to the fore here. And, wow. and yeah, those of us who, who, who've trodden a similar path sometimes talk about this in terms of the empire striking back. So that many of the challenges facing inner city, um, you know, London, Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow, Sheffield and, and others in this country and their equivalents in France, Germany, Spain, Portugal uh, and beyond today and the US um, are actually quite similar to the challenges that people working in the global south had to address as early as the 1950s and 60s. And that's come together with you know, European and North American urban sociology and geography that looked at different issues. They did do segregation studies and so on already in, in the 60s and 70s, but from those kinds of theoretical frameworks that you mentioned. But it's the, the merging of that with agendas from the global south that I think have opened up all sorts of vistas and got us out of some of that sort of historically and, and, and culturally deterministic um, straitjacket that, that was the baggage from the past. 
That's 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 really interesting. So so this, this is arguably a, a kind of critical lens or a critical set of tools that perhaps emerged in in the, the global side, but we're increasingly Absolutely. turning we're turning yeah. back on the experience of, of the global north because of course what we're interested in here isn't just developing world cities, although right. de developing world cities often have particular sets of challenges that they, that they that they face. But this is global cities generally. Exactly. The sustainable agenda. And one of the things that you definitely do mention in the lecture is the is the kind of the ever the increasing centrality of, of urbanism in things like the Millennium Development Goals, followed by the Sustainable Development Goals, where where the urban experience in terms of resilience, for example, and mm. I think safety and security and equity become right. increasingly codified as part of those ways of measuring the success. Right. Uh, and sustainability of particular environments. Indeed. And I think that's really important too. Um, it's very challenging because um, many of these sort of global agendas still have quite a strong legacy of sort of Anglo-American or uh, US, European sort of cultures and so on. So the ideas that underpinned the UN system when it was established in the uh, late 1940s and the 50s, and which underpin, for example, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is often invoked in terms of today's justice, equity agendas, uh, and the right to the city, and 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 that whole set of debates and 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 uh, conundrums have their origin in what was then still a very sort of Euro-America-centric world, and the if you like, liberal social democratic values in the most positive sense that underpin them. And those are often still challenged by radical critics um, from the global south saying that this is too culturally deterministic and, and your idea of individualized human rights and, and liberties, which play out of course in relation to vaccines for COVID-19, uh, right to bear arms in the US and, and other sort of contemporary debates. So it's not just historical, this is very real and, and, and you know, uh, present day, those dilemmas do need to be addressed as part of this research. And one of the challenges of doing this comparative north-south urban sustainability work that I was mentioning was precisely that. So we had to sit down, sorry, <coughs> got a little bit of energy today in, in the wind. Um, <coughs> was having to sit down with people from very different backgrounds, both professional and in terms of the kinds of institutions and the roles that they play in societies. So sitting down with Swedish academics, local government officials, civil society um, leaders, some private sector representatives, the equivalent in the UK, the equivalent in South Africa, Kenya, Argentina, India, for example, highly challenging and getting them around the table and to try to tease out all of these issues. And when somebody in Western Kenya on the shores of Lake Victoria refers to uh, human rights, how does their understanding in an urban context differ from that of uh, a leader of uh, a UK urban borough council, for instance? And yeah. these are really important. And that process of building confidence and trust through discussions and negotiations and finding out what we have in common underpin the whole enterprise. And that's why the process of international consultation around the SDGs and indeed the new urban agenda was rather important because that was the most protracted, the most detailed um, and the most um, participatory process that the UN has ever undertaken in terms of, I mean, it was nationally determined. So, um, you know, it was up to the national governments in each case how to, to steer the process. But in many, many countries, not all, but the majority, there were quite substantial levels of uh, civil society, private sector, uh, and other <coughs> stakeholders um, actively involved. And, and the final versions of the, the targets and the indicators and so on that came out reflect that process. They're still not perfect. Um, yeah. They have to be practicable, and we did some experimental work to test whether you know, your average city, so to speak, could actually do some of this realistically, and they tweaked the targets and indicators in, in that light of the, the pilot research. But there are still very real challenges, and I'm working 
uh, with partners elsewhere who are doing the reporting. We look at the UN summaries of all the annual and quadrennial reports that come in, and they're still making minor improvements. But the key point, which I would want to emphasize here, is that this is not intended as you know, the world's best ever or, or, or theoretically possible exercise. It's the best chance at a practicable exercise to get something like 200 countries and the tens of thousands of urban areas with a population of over 50,000 to report on a set of indicators and more importantly to use the opportunity to rethink how and what they do and to make those more sustainable. The UN doesn't have a sanction, it's not going to come and, and impose fines on the city of X or the municipality of Y. That's up to the people themselves to do. But it's been part of an international framework. And one of the interesting things I've learned through doing all this is how important the competitive instinct among mayors and chief executives of cities actually is. There's nothing that winds them up more than knowing that the next door city or the one across the border that they sort of like to compare themselves with has actually got something or is doing something that they haven't yet or can't yet. And then there are all these international networks of municipal membership organizations or the large city, C40 cities, for example, uh, which has its headquarters in New York and London and with which I'm also collaborating now um, that share good practice and encourage them to do things. But those networks are really important fora through which the mayors, the chief execs, the city engineers and the other stakeholders um, exchange information, understand what's going on and learn to adapt things to be appropriate in their own uh, respective situations. You made a very powerful point, David, that, that we cannot achieve the kind of sustainability that we need to achieve as a human society unless our cities <clears throat> become sustainable in and of themselves you know it, cities are play are a very active component in this particularly given right. the, the level of human habitation in cities yeah. and i mean of course in in your talk you i'm just going to bring up the the cover slide again you talk sure. about accessibility the green blueness and the fairness of cities and so uh, i just wondered can, you know can i just press you because we were talking about practicality and practicability mm -hmm. um in terms of things like accessibility, can you just mm -hmm. open that up for us a little bit more? Just sure. as a reminder, just tell us you know, sure. what, what would accessibility look like? And doesn't that, in fact, depend somewhat on which kind of city, where it might be? And, and are, I mean, are there a set of stages and processes that cities might go through in order to achieve higher levels of accessibility, for example? The answer to the last bit, if I can start there, is yes, absolutely. Um, but the the key point is that um facilities shops schools hospitals um various services that individuals and households and communities require um, are not uniformly distributed across the city they tend to be either along major uh, infrastructure corridors you know the high street in a, in a city or or particular areas but crucially um the towns and cities that we either love or hate today have evolved around and as a consequence of revolutions in transport technology over the last 150 years or so. Initially, the railways, and then more recently, buses, uh, originally horse-drawn omnibuses, and then motor buses, and finally, the private cars. And the key point there is that these have enabled urban areas either spontaneously um, through land speculation and, and individual uh, decisions to expand, or indeed as a matter of policy. Uh, and so you have uh, this kind of strange spectrum between a, a relatively dense uh, and, and densely occupied central area of, broadly speaking, declining density of population as you move out until you get to low density suburbs and the lowest densities are the highest income areas or even lower density once you get beyond those into areas of small holdings or mixed land use on the urban or even beyond the urban fringe into the so-called peri-urban areas of transition mm -hmm. to what we might recognize as rural. That changes, it's not an even gradient, uh, it reflects planning, it reflects land speculation, topography, all sorts of other social and cultural influences too. Um, but the key point as a result of all of that is that many people rely on motor vehicle access and private cars mm -hmm. to reach different services and facilities. And that is increasingly recognized as fundamentally 
unsustainable. And so the kinds of rethinking that we're working towards and how we're trying to get local authorities and private sector firms and, and all the other stakeholders, including individual households, your family and mine, to rethink what we do is how we can increase the proportion of our um, necessary journeys that are undertaken within, say, one and a half or two kilometers, which means that we could topography, weather, and all the rest of it permitting, walk and or cycle to a large proportion of them or use buses uh, or mini bus feeder services into um, major stations or bus interchanges where you would do your connections to, to longer uh, journeys. But do most of your shopping, most of your education, uh, your primary healthcare needs within that sort of neighborhood. And that's the principle underlying what uh, is now being referred to as the 15 or 20 minute neighborhood or city which is back to multifunctional land use away from the single land use zoning, which was the consequence of those transport revolutions I mentioned. And if we can achieve that, um, then it will go a long way to, to addressing accessibility because not only the physical distance is relevant, it's the effort distance. So one and a half, two kilometers um, in a city like uh, Rio de Janeiro is a very different proposition from one and a half, two kilometers in Copenhagen, where the difference in topography might be a meter and a half, um, and, and everybody has about five bicycles and, and all the rest of it and uses them. Um, so it's, it's topography, it's financial cost, it's frequency and reliability and affordability of the public transport services and all those sort of things. But this is a big revolution, particularly if you're having to restructure an existing urban area or neighborhood within an urban area. It's far easier in terms of where you redevelop, say, you know, docklands or old industrial areas that have been flattened and are being redeveloped as brownfield uh, regeneration sites or in rapidly growing um, cities of, of the global south, uh, China and India, where essentially you're designing new areas from scratch. Then you can do this much more easily. But the challenge of retrofitting is that unless you have a redevelopment opportunity at scale, it's more piecemeal, it's more costly. But, and this is the key thing, many of our older cities in this country actually predate those transport revolutions of the railway, the omnibus, the motor bus, and, and the car. Mm -hmm. And therefore, actually, if you think about London, or indeed Greater Manchester, these are, one might say, and some people living there actually refer to it in this term, London or Greater Manchester, whatever, is a collection of villages. Mm. They've been strung together. The key infrastructure is almost an afterthought other than the ones that were the original horse routes or, or carriage routes out to, to neighboring cities. But if we can recuperate that sense of a, a slightly more local focus so that your neighborhoods of, of Fulham or, or Newham or Tower Hamlets or, or Hampstead or wherever it is, become much more the focus of most of the daily, weekly trips. And then you go to the central part of London or you go to other areas for selected purposes to see friends or for high level medical uh, services, whatever it is. That will in itself go a long way, even in existing urban areas, to achieving a much higher level of sustainability and accessibility. I think, that, David, this is a potentially a, a good moment to bring in a question that has come in over the course sure. of the week. Uh, and I'm going to bring it up on the screen so you, you can read it. It comes from Dave Perks. And he asks, how can cities be sustainable and deal with issues of gentrification? So I think uh, the, the, re the reason I think it's a good moment to bring it in is because, you know, you, you are talking about, uh, let's say, mass redevelopment of particular areas. <laughs> gentrification is, it is, a, is a process. It can be of new de newly developed Absolutely. or regeneration areas, but, it can, but it's also kind of all, uh, very often retrofitting uh, existing properties. Yeah, uh, properties. So, uh, do you see gentrification as an as an issue in here? Is that something that you've considered in work? It is. It's it's a very large issue. It's often the proverbial elephant in the room, and it actually has a very sharp um, contemporary relevance, because going back to what I was saying a moment ago about trying to sort of reinvent the fabric of existing urban areas for greater sustainability, one of the major changes that is beginning to emerge. Um, in central areas of London, of Greater Manchester, Birmingham, New York, um, Paris, uh, Frankfurt, and, and, and others, is as a result of the pandemic, 
a revolution, and I'm using that word advisedly, a revolution in working practices of particularly service industries, office-based functions, because obviously if you're in, in a factory and you're making things or selling things in a supermarket or, or a retail facility, you've got to be on the premises. But for most office-based activities and even higher education, um, the pandemic has taught us with the accompanying revolutions in online platforms like the one that we're using right now, that homeworking is a realistic opportunity for many people, that it can be as productive or in certain circumstances, perhaps even more productive than being in a large office with, with tons of people who provide distractions themselves, even though it might be socially very nice. Uh, and it saves the cost and the time and the hassle of commuting. So what is beginning to happen en masse is that people who would previously have been expected to be in the office from you know, nine to five or whatever their office hours might be, Monday to Friday, are now being allowed and in some cases actually encouraged or required to work from home part of the week and in the office the other part. So most common split is three days and two days one way or the other and can be a flexible arrangement depending on precise circumstances. So if we think about the implications of that for the commuting that goes on on a normal basis into central London, the West End, the city of London, or the equivalent financial sector centers in Birmingham, in Greater Manchester, in Leeds, and, and, and so forth. That's fundamental because you're reducing the daily commute and the number of people who need offices, um, workstations at their desk, who are going to be frequenting the convenience stores at lunchtime or coffee time for the coffee or the packed lunches or the sandwiches or even the, the gastro pubs, who are going to be using gyms in those areas after work is greatly reduced by between 40 and 60. So let's call it 50% on average. And already I know in various places from Egham down the road from, from Royal Holloway to the center of London and the other big cities where some private developers are realizing that this is now going to be a much longer lasting change than was originally anticipated. And therefore there will not be the demand for uh, retail office space in the way that was planned or uh, yeah, desired. And mm -hmm. so many firms are downsizing um, from, let's say, for argument's sake, five floors to three floors, and then they're subletting the other two if they own the building. If they're tenants, well, it's the landlord's agenda that's, that's challenged. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. what's happening on aggregate is that many developers are starting to convert office blocks or parts of office blocks into residential accommodation. And coming back to the question about gentrification, this is where it becomes critical, because if they are private developers purely seeking to maximize the profitability of their existing investment and the conversion to residential, those will be targeted at middle income people, probably in most cases without children, who are able to afford commercial uh, rentals or, or prices if they're sold off in those central locations. But therefore, in order to make the areas more equitable and to avoid the gentrification that that process implies, they would need intervention by local authorities and housing associations through subsidies or restrictions or requirements um, that you know, a certain percentage of redevelopment of more than five units needed to be social housing provision and so on, which we've had in the recent past in this country. Those are the kinds of interventions that can be critical in avoiding total gentrification, in ensuring a residential mix of people of different income backgrounds, and therefore ensuring that accessibility applies to all, not just to the wealthy who could actually afford higher transport costs and, and, and travel distances in the first place. The same was true a few years ago with redevelopments of Docklands around the country and elsewhere, mm. where a lot of the apartment blocks um, had lots of potential to do exactly this within accessible distances of major employment nodes. But because it was private led and, and, and not subsidized in any way, they're all aimed at the NIMBY category of young professionals, uh, lots of pubs and eateries and so on. And, and most working class people, when they go there, you know, there's nothing for them. They can't afford it. There's not the facilities they would, would wish to use or be able to use. And that is why this is such a critical 
um, elephant in the room, as I called it a bit earlier. Uh, I mean, that, it's really interesting, isn't it? The, I mean, the pandemic could could very could shake up that that whole structure of our cities. It, it, I think it, it really has changed that we'll have seen for decades since the you know, deindustrialization. In fact, yeah. Um, but as you say, unless unless there are policies in place, it, it, that that change may not happen in overall a desirable way, or at least not in a way that would ultimately fulfil the kind of objectives that you have written about. That, that there may be change. The cities might become greener because <clears throat> there have to be fewer people movements in order to right. make this work. But it's not necessarily fairer Indeed. unless there are policies in place designed to keep yep. it fair. Yes. And, and on the green, this bit, I mean, one of the temporary adaptations, uh, emergency during lockdowns and, and when people were being advised not to use public transport because of the, the sort of perceived health risks, but to walk or cycle. And, and many people you know, didn't use their cars. We saw a huge increase in walking, in cycling. Uh, local authorities created temple cycleways, uh, temporary cycleways. They broadened pavements to allow people to walk in both directions without sort of jostling each other and so on. And now those things are up for review. In some contexts, they're being made permanent or being extended in life. Others, they've been scrapped. So you have a bit of a piecemeal if you walk through London or cycle through London or other major cities at the moment. And there, again, is you know, an opportunity for um, positive and proactive intervention to ensure that those um, walking and cycling and other mixed-use opportunities are not lost. Because if they are, that will simply reinforce the return to the status quo that existed beforehand, rather than using it as a springboard to make changes and to restrict vehicles um, and, and encourage that shorter distance, more multifunctional pattern of life and encourage people to relocate their residences perhaps into areas that were previously unaffordable or inaccessible and thereby achieve those sort of broader sustainability objectives. David, thanks so much. Listen, I'm I'm aware of the time we've been we've been chatting unbelievably for nearly forty minutes. Uh, the time the time has flown by. Uh, I I have learnt a lot. We've had a really good number of viewers uh, as well. That I've been observing uh, as we've been going, uh, and so what I'd encourage people to do at home is please do share this on, uh, share this video via Facebook uh, and YouTube to anybody else that you think might be interested in it. Uh, do you also access the resources that David has put together. And I'm just gonna bring up the, the web address. So if you follow www.rhul.ac.uk forward slash geography, you can follow links to the teacher hub and that's where you can download the teaching resources and revision resources that go along with this and indeed every other lecture that we have done as part of these Monday night lecture sessions. And I think we must have about 25 lectures uh, on there now covering everything from uh, glaciology and climate change through to sustainable cities, as you've heard, as you've heard about this evening. So there's a great range of resources there for you to for you to engage in. Um, David, just sit just sit there for me, if you wouldn't mind, just for a, a second or two sure. more, because next week on the 28th of February, we have uh, another uh, lecture coming up that is going to be on patterns of glacial retreat, and that's going to be with Dr. Adrian Palmer, and then the Q and A for that will be the week will be the week following. So that, that will be the last session that we have before Easter. And then we've already got a, a, spring, uh, a spring calendar uh, emerging uh, as well. And I'll publicize that uh, starting from, from next week. So lots more to come during the course of this academic year. David, it falls to me just to say thank you to you once more for, for last week and indeed again for, for this evening. Thanks so much. Great pleasure. Time. And I hope our listeners and viewers have um, found it valuable and it will help with um, successful completion of their respective A-level programs. Thank you. And, and also the, the inspiration that you provided earlier for, for geographers and their place in, in, in the employment. I think it's a really important thing for people to hear. There was a statistic a few years ago that geographers were the most employed non-vocational graduates anywhere in the UK. And, and, I, and I think I can see why, you know, I think geographers <laughs> have got the skills that they need to go out and be really good utility figures in all kinds of different industries. So thank, thank you for reminding us of that. I'm just going to bring up the final slide and I'll, and I'll fade out with this. This just has all of the details of where you can find this and other lectures. David, thanks again. Take care. Thank you very much.